Hello, everyone. All right, let's start. Um, first thing first, probably this is the last time that I'm going to create a project. Um, so we'll create a new project with Visual Studio, empty project. Make sure that you are uh, using Windows uh, console application, C++ Windows console. Empty project. Next. Select a folder in which you want your directories to be uh, your, uh, uh, your project to be in. I'm going to do it in a GitHub repository. Select the folder. It's 06 September 13th uh, section uh, AB, right? So create. And three years later, it's going to create um, the application, and we can start working. Oh, there we go. Snap it up here. All right, a new version is available. We'll install it later. All right, add a new item. I'll add a program.cpp, and that's what we are going to start our work. Number one, any questions? Wait, 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 wait. Go. Explain uh, namespace. Explaining namespace. Explaining namespace. Okay, so. Uh, today we'll talk about it. Okay. Uh, namespaces. Namespaces. Um, uh, namespace essentially is a feature in C++ which prevents uh, name collisions. Which means if you have several dis different aspects of one thing to look at, you can actually create it in different namespaces. Let me clarify. As I mentioned. If you, are talk, if you are talking about a person and you want to talk about the person as a teacher, so you want to create a class for a teacher. Now you want to look at teacher from student's perspective. If you want to do that, then you have to create a teacher that uh, teaches certain things and ratings of the students and uh, how well he uh, marks his uh, Assignments, how he marks in exams. These are the things that students want to know about a teacher. But then you want to create a teacher class for the administration, for a college. It's the same class. It's still called teacher. But for that one, it's the amount of salary the guy get, is getting, the, the, or the lady, or uh, the amount of experience, which fields that the person is teaching. So the two aspects of the teacher are completely different things depending who is talking about it. If we have such a scenario and we want to have both aspects in one program, it's impossible because you cannot have two classes with the same name. Correct? If that's the case, then we need to have for each aspect of the story a namespace. A namespace called student, a namespace called HR or human resources. You create a class for a teacher in the namespace student, and you create a, a class for a teacher in namespace HR, and they can coexist beside each other because they are in different namespaces now. If you want to refer to the teacher from the student, you say student scope resolution, teacher. If you want to refer to the teacher from the HR point of view, you go HR scope resolution, teacher. Therefore, you can have the same class from different points of view in a same application, okay? Namespaces serve in many different ways. For example, all the standard features of C++, there are so many different classes that it's very high possibility that you create a class that has the exact same name of the class that you have in C++. There are, like, 
Have you seen that thing? There is an app for that, okay? In C++, there's a template for that, okay? Anything that you think about, there is a template for it. There is a, 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 li a, a library for it that does it for you. So there are many things that you don't want to use the features of C++. You want to create your own feature. If we did not have namespaces, you could not create that. You had to give it some awkward name. Because of that fact, they put all the standard features of C++ in one namespace called STD for standard. Okay? And that's why in most of your cases, you write include this and that and using namespace STD, which essentially means I don't want to keep mentioning STD scope resolution, STD scope resolution. So if I actually write a program, if I write include IO stream, if I can type include, it would be nice, include IO stream, and I write int main, return zero. If I want to do C out hello, I can say STD scope resolution, C out hello. Why? Because C out is, a, is from the standard class O stream, and because of that, it's, it resides in the uh, STD scope resolution. If I only have one C out, that's what I'm going to do. And I run it, and the program's going to work not well. Why? Because I have an end L over there, correct? And L is again, again is, it is defined in IO stream. IO stream is in STD, so that's not going to work out either. And L is not known. I have to say STD over there too. Oh. And then now it compiles and it says hello. Now, if I do not want to keep repeating STD scope resolution, STD scope resolution, I can make my life easy by simply saying, hey, since I am using this namespace so many times, if you find something that you cannot find in current scope, take a look at the STD namespace, see if it's there or not. Therefore, I can write this code. Okay? So when you are, and we said, from now till the end of the semester, any code you create, you create, is going to be in the namespace SDDS. You have to do that. I do not, I'm not going to mention it in any workshop anymore. Anything we ask you to write will be in namespace SDDS. Any main that you write that uses your code will use namespace SDDS. So, any code, library, class, anything you create, you will put it in namespace SDDS. When you write the main to test it, if you like, either you can keep putting SDDS scope resolution, or if you don't want to go through the hassle, you simply say using namespace SDDS and you're fine. Are we okay with that? Are we clear with namespaces? Any other question? And thank you for the question. Any question one? Any question two? All right, so let's uh, continue. Oh, yeah. Give me a second. Give me a second. Let me come to you. I'm going to bring a microphone next time. Oh, what is abstraction? Oh, abstraction. Abstraction is exactly what I told you about the teacher. What did I tell you about the teacher? I said the teacher can be seen in two different voice of points of view. It means two different abstractions. An, ab an abstraction essentially means, abstraction essentially means pick what you want, ignore what you don't. That's what, have you seen abstract art? When you look at it, you have no idea what the heck it means. But the artist is only painting one dimension of the thing that is painting. And therefore, in his face, it's Eiffel Tower. But when you look at it, it looks like a baguette, right? So, <laughs> so, so that's what it is. So, so what I'm saying is that, what I'm saying is that abstraction is that. Abstraction essentially means look at a problem, Pick the parts that you want to fix and ignore the rest. If you, can, if you don't become master of abstraction, you are never a good programmer. 
you're going to be one of those people who keeps adding to their code that are never satisfied. Oh, I could have done this. I could have added this one. What about this one? What about that? One? You should be able to stop yourself and say, I don't want this anymore. This is solving my problem. No more bells and whistles. And that makes everything possible. All right? Okay? Are we okay? One? Oh, here we go. Yes, sir. So I just kind of want to add on to that. So is it basically just saying we're just including like the bare minimum of what we need to achieve like a certain for abstraction? Yeah. That's essentially the, the, the definition of abstraction. Okay? Abstraction means don't go wild. Okay? Okay? Don't be a hero. That's how I always say. Don't be a hero. Do what, you, do what you've been asked to do and ignore the rest. If you do anything extra, you are just paying it because uh, out of your own pocket. Yes, ma'am. Sir, is this program supposed to work in 2003 version of the Visual Studio? Yeah, it works. 2003? First of all. 2013. Oh, 13? Okay. It's time to update. Okay. <laughs> But it, but it should work. It should work. But because it's not a lab, I cannot come to you. After the class, I can, I can check it out. Okay? Yeah. But uh, you can update. You have Visual Studio, and all these things are free for you. Take advantage of it and install it. Okay? Uh, and this is basic C++ works with even 2003 version of Visual Studio. Any questions? Yes. Uh huh. Do you mind going over when we would make a class public? I haven't even. That's next week's lecture. Privacy. No, no, no. We, we. I talked. What I did the last week when I came over here, I gave you and I told you, the lecture that I gave today is essentially to the end of OP two four four. Okay, so I kind of gave you a taste of what you are going to learn. So that's actually a good point that you brought up. The lab that you're going to see, it's coming up lab two, okay? It's not an object-oriented program. By all means, it's a C program written with C++ syntax, okay, and using C++ features. So the lab that you are going to do is in no way an uh, even object-related program. Okay, it's an absolutely structured program just to uh, teach you what overloading is and what dynamic memory allocation is, and that's it, okay? So um, I, I've seen lots of you are eager to start writing classes and do those objects and stuff like that. Don't worry, they're all going to come. Baby steps, okay? But uh, sure, we'll go through it when the time comes. Anything else? Any questions? One? Ah, here we go. Um, the polymorphism thing to be explained and when I was reading Explain it, what is po polymorphism? Yeah. Polymorphism essentially is when you have the same thing happening in different ways. Um, I'm going to give you an example for it now, today. One of the ways that polymorphism happens in C++. Doing the same thing, actually your lab is all about it. The lab that you're writing, you're going to write one read function, and you keep writing the read function and again, again for five different things. So you say read, depending on what is being read, automatically it's going to do it. So we'll, we'll, we'll go through it again. Again, polymorphism is I walk, a monkey walks. We both walk. One walks like this, and the other one walks like this, right? So it's completely like they are both doing the action of walking but it's in a different way because human is doing the walk, now monkey is doing the walk, and then the bird is going to do the walk. They are all walking, but they are done in different ways. And I gave you the explanation of airplane flies, pigeon flies, I don't know, grasshopper flies or whatever, okay? So the action of flying is uh, done differently in different objects and so on and so forth. So essentially, if they, some, somebody asks you perfect explanation of what is polymorphism, doing the same thing in a different way. All right? Yes, and it has many different aspects. When we come to polymorphism, we have four major aspects that I'm going to tell you at the end of the semester. I'm not going to tell you now because it's just going to be gibberish to you. 
Well, at the end of the semester where you experience all four different aspects of it, when I tell you, you're going to say, aha, I know what you're talking about now. Okay? So different types of polymorphism, we'll go through it. But for now, just remember, many shapes. Polymorphism means many shapes. Anything that has many shapes, that's what it is. That's what polymorphism is. Okay? For example, this is a polymorph thing. That's a polymorph operator. Correct? I put hello over there, hello is printed. I put an integer, integer is printed. I put a double over there, double gets printed. Do you mention I want to print a double? No, you just print. It knows which one it has to be. It's like you say, bird, fly. Airplane, fly. They all know how to fly in a different way. So that's the perfect example of polymorphism. That little operator that you see over there that does C out. Okay? It's one thing that is doing many different things for you. Doing printing in many different ways. You follow? All right. All good questions. All good questions. Any questions? One. Any qu oh, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, actually, I'm loving this class. This is the first time this is happening in 22 years. Like, I want to know about the transaction, like how it transfers. Transaction? Or, uh, yeah. I have no idea what it's like. Like it was written in the module that you have posted on the blackboard. I actually wrote something I called transaction? No, no, no. In the, the links that you see here, in the module program. In modular program, transaction. I have to see it. I don't know what is that. Oh. Okay, I have no idea what is tra transaction. Uh, it's not an object-oriented terminology. So you want me to take a look at it? Tell me where it is. I'll take a look at it. I... Oh, so it's a sample code. Okay, so, um, sorry. Uh, modular programming, transaction. Oh, okay. Oh, it's just an example. It's the way of, it has nothing to do with object orientation. It's giving you an example of a transaction. It's, I, 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 don't want to, I don't want to go through it. Read it again, or if you have a problem with it, come on and explain what does it mean. That's, that has nothing to do with, with that's no topic. It's just a, a part of the uh, text written for an example. OK? Anything else? Yes, sir, coming to you. Encapsulation. You're going to go. Encapsulation, I'll do it next week. Okay? Encapsulation, I'll do next week. Not today. Anything else? And inheritance, the same thing. I'll do it after the break. Not today. <laughs> yes, sir. What about UML? UML. UML is not my class. System analysis and design. Okay? UML, system analysis and design. When you take that course, they'll tell you exactly what it is. Nothing to do with me. Okay, UML is essentially a notation that you do when you want to do object-oriented design. How to draw, like, a, yeah. anyways, you'll, you'll know in, a, in system analysis and design, not my, not my course. Uh, are we okay? Are we okay, one? I'm going to do this 50 times. You, you can keep, ask, keep asking questions at the end of the day, and I'm going to continue answering. I, I, that's the most important thing, actually. Any questions, one? Questions two. Okay, done. Now, I'm going to bring up the topics. Again, uh, as I mentioned before, I use uh, the, the notes that are up here to, as kind of a something that organizes me to, to talk about things. So I don't really, uh, I, it's bad to say I didn't read these things. Uh, I, I, <laughs> Uh, so I don't know what the content of the thing is, so if you tell me what is the third paragraph over there, I don't know. I just take a look at what we have over there and I explain it, okay? So, um, types essentially in, in, in C++ is uh, um, 
a, a framework, a mold in which you, you, from with which you create entities. Now, types can be uh, uh, things like a, a, a coffee a cup. It could be a type. Okay, so you have a coffee cup, you can create five coffee cups out of it. And as soon as you say coffee cup, things that come with a coffee cup comes. It's like the lid and the, the capacity and all the things that a coffee cup is. Okay, these are types. Any type. Now we have certain types that cannot be broken down into pieces. They are fundamental types. Those are the things that you have seen in C language. Okay, they all exist in C++ except one thing. Okay, Boolean. So I'm not going to tell you what a character is. If you don't know what a character is, go back and take IPC 144. Okay, we know what character is. We know what an it character integer is, short is, long is, long, long is. We know all these things. We've done it in IPC 144. The only thing is Boolean. Boolean is, uh, I think it was created because too many people whined that I don't like the fact that we, anything other than zero is true in C language. They wanted actual truth and falsehood. Okay, it's essentially a, 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 a variable that keeps true or false, but behind the scene it's just an integer that is zero and non-zero. Okay, so you can actually create pull, and it's a good thing to do to, to have true or false returned. It makes the type safety better. So if you are having an if statement, you know you're not making a mistake if you have a variable over there. If I have integer x, if I say if x, it means if x is not zero, it's true. If it's zero, it's false, right? But if you actually have the x as true or false, then compiler knows you're not making a mistake. It is actually a condition you are checking, not you didn't want to check, check, check the uh, uh, content of a variable. So that's essentially what it is. So when you create a, an integer of type Boolean, it's essentially true or false, which is one or zero. But again, still, this is a backward compatible fully. C++ is C language. Have no doubt. Nothing is changed. It's C language with one feature that is object-oriented added to it. That's why they call it C++ because it has one more feature. I mentioned that before, right? So uh, everything that you have done in C, C language, it works over here, which means still any non-zero value is true, okay? Yeah, this is an example that I always what is the value of, uh, actually, it writes over there, 1, okay? So, essentially, if you have a value, it's considered true if you look at it as a condition. So, if I have integer x4 and I say not 4, not 4 is 0, right? But when I say not 0, it doesn't go back to 4. It makes it true. So, if the system is telling you what is true, it's always 1. If the system is checking a condition to see if it's true, it's not zero that is true, which means any value that is not zero. Remember that. So whenever a system is giving you a result of something being true or false, it could be zero or one and nothing else. But if the system is checking a condition to see if it's true or not, the only thing it's checked is zero. If it's zero, it's false. Otherwise, it's true no matter what the value is. Remember that. Anything other than zero translates to true when it deals with conditions. Compound times, we, we have dealt with it in IPC 144, are essentially uh, types created of other types and other compound types. Okay? So I have a structured transaction, right, that has stuff in it, right? So when I say transaction, account, type, and the amount will come with it. Essentially, I package three things in one thing, and I call it a compound type. Compa in C++, in C language, for a compound type to be used by type, quote unquote, you had to actually put struct in front of it. So if you created struct transaction, you had to say struct transaction A, struct transaction B. In C++, any compound type that is created is immediately turned to a type, which means if you have struct transaction, as of that moment, transaction becomes a type. So you can say transaction A, transaction B, and create an instance out of it. Absolutely no difference with it. Yeah, it's actually mentioning it over here too. There you go. You see? 
auto keyboard keyboard uh, uh, don't use it in my class you're going to use it when it comes it's useful when it comes to templates auto essentially means i'm too lazy to to write what the type is and just guess what it is and create it for me so if i say auto x is equal to four it looks at four is four in yeah so i'm going to make it an integer it guarantees that you are actually having the proper type for it well, it comes handy when we are dealing with templates in OOP three four five. Yes. Can you switch the type if it's an auto? So if it, can you like cast it like if it was a four? Auto it doesn't make any difference with a regular type. It's exactly so when it's done, it's done. If it's an integer, it's it's going to be an integer. It's as if you write int x is equal to four. No difference. Can you cast an int to a double? Yes, you can. So auto doesn't do anything other than at the moment of creating the variable, it checks to see what the variable is assigned to and creates the exact same thing. And it's been there forever, but with a different meaning. Now in new one, it's uh, in uh, new C++, it makes a difference. Uh, If you have integer x equal to 4 and treat x as a character, is it trouble? So it does not make any difference. Again, auto doesn't do, ma it doesn't do anything different. The only thing that you do is do your, now you know x is an integer. Whatever you have done with integer before, you do it now. Whatever you have done to a double before, you do it now. It doesn't matter what. And by the way, what is a character? In C, I know what kind of a data type. What is a character? It's a single character, which means what is a character? What is a character in C language? It's an integer, for heaven's sake. It's just a small integer. There is no character in C or C. We don't have a type character in C or C++. C and C++ is incapable of holding the figure A anywhere. That's why they hold its code, 65. And because character is big enough for the ASCII code, right, that's again IPC 144. That's why if I have character A, then I do A++, it becomes the next one, or previous one. So again, all you guys know the answer. I know you knew this. But the thing is that, remember, these are the things that they're going to ask you if you're going for an interview to see if you actually know the language in depth or not. <clears throat> declarations. Now, for declarations, we know that. We don't need that. If you have a function that comes after a function, you need to have declaration for it. That declaration, we call it a prototype, right? So if I have the function fa that I wrote incorrectly because it's returning an integer, if I have fun function fa using foo and foo is implemented after fa, then we're going to have a prototype foo at the top. We know that, right? Are we okay with it? Are we okay? So that's the first thing, declaration. But we have declaration for other things too. Say, um, say I have a structure created to represent a car. So a car has a license plate and I make a model, right? Then I want this car to be parked in a parking slot somewhere. So if that's the case, so if that's the case, I have to create a structure, I call it a parking slot, that holds the car, but it has a slot number two. Right? You go, where is your car? It's in slot 55. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? And if I want to have a parking lot, my parking lot is essentially an array of parking slots, correct? Right? Are we okay with this? Anybody have any problem with, it, with this design? I have a car. Car has license plate. And it has a make and model. 
and I can p park that car in a, maybe I should have called that thing parking spot. Spot is better or slot, which one? How many say spot? How many say slot? Okay, spot it is. It's actually important, believe it or not. The reason is that spot. Oh. Okay, so yeah, so my car is parked in a car parking spot, and the spot number is 52. Okay, now in a parking lot, I have several parking spots, right? That may have a car or may not, correct? And that's my parking. That's the that's my abstraction for the person who asked of a parking lot. Okay? Do I care that if it's asphalt or it's grass or it's whatever? No, that's not important for me. What is important for me is which car is parked where. That's what I want to know, and that's what I encapsulated in here. Uh oh. Encapsulation. That's what I abstracted in here. Yeah, whatever. Okay, sure. So we're okay with this? Now, with this, with this, Design of mine, if you have, with this design of mine, if you have a car's license plate or make and model, can you find out where it is quickly without programming? No, because a car doesn't know where it's parked. You have to go through every single parking spot in a parking lot, do a search from beginning to the end, one by one, check for the license plate to see where it's parked, right? What if I wanted the car to know which parking spot it wants to be in? Then it would have been nice if I could actually hold the address of the programming address, not the address like 52 Young Street, the address of the parking spot inside the car. What if I, when I'm inserting the car into a parking spot, I'm going to say the parking spot you are parked in is this one. So anytime I want to see where a car is, I simply follow that pointer and I'm at, at the, I'm, I'm at the place. I know exactly where it is. I don't have to do a search. You follow what I'm saying? There is one problem happening over here. The problem is chicken and the egg. If I, have, if I have the parking spot in the car, the structure of parking spot is coming after. So I should put the parking spot first. If I put the park, parking spot first, it's due using a car. What am I supposed to do? The answer is forward declaration. It's exactly like prototype, but it's for a class, which means I can tell at the beginning, hey, Mr. Compiler, don't worry. A structure is coming up. The name is parking spot. It's like a prototype for a function. Okay? But there is one thing that you need to know, and that's the definition between that's the and that's the difference between declaration and definition. Declaration and definition. Parking spot up there is a declaration for a structure called parking spot, correct? Are we okay with this? But you have seen we put a structure in a header file and that becomes the definition and the declaration of a structure. You include it in different files and they all know what a parking spot is, right? Now, if I switch these two, if I bring the parking spot up and bring the car down, can I forward declare a car and get away with it? The question is that if I do something like this, can I get away with it? Struct car up there is a declaration. It's not a definition. I do not give enough information to the compiler by that statement at line one, what a car is and how to build it. Correct? Are we okay with this? 
Now take a look at number three, line number three. What am I doing over there? I am creating a car, correct? Does compiler have enough information at line three to actually build a car? No, so you can't do this. When it was the other way, when it was the other way, At line five, what I am, I am again declaring a, 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 a structure coming called marking, parking spot, right? At line five, what am I doing? Am I creating a parking spot? No, it's just an address of something, and all addresses are the same thing. It doesn't matter. Address is address. It's just the target that is different, right? Therefore, a parking spot is not being built. Compiler doesn't need to build a parking spot because of that, so I am on the good. Okay, so remember, forward declaration can only be done if it's a declaration and not a definition. One more time. Forward declaration can only be done if it's required for a declaration and not a definition. If the definition is not needed, you can do forward declaration. If it is, you have to change your design. Are we okay with this? Tough stuff, I know. These are tricky things that we need to know, but we need to know, nevertheless. All these things I have created, I'm actually cheating, as you see over here. I prepared it so that the, the, the files are there. It's 01 declaration, 02 forward. So one by one, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring these up, and, and I'm going to post it, so you're going to see all these things. Don't worry if I'm not saving it. They're all there. I'm going to post it. Okay? So you have the code. You don't need to take pictures. You don't need to. Okay, I'm going to pa pause to make a threat. Give me a second. All right. Now everybody's wondering, watching the video, what was the threat? So, next thing. <clears throat> Array of pointers. We have dealt with arrays a lot. We have worked with pointers Kind of, in IPC 144, right? But array of pointers is something that we need to know because you're going to use it a lot, OK? So let's go back to this car thingy, but I'm going to make it a little bit uh, simpler. I don't want to implement a parking spot right now. I just want to say that we have a car, OK? I have a car. And I'm going to write a code to display that car. now. To do this, I need to teach one thing before we continue. So pause. I'm going to go back. Let those two things be. My name is Fardak, but please call me Freddy. OK? What did I just do? Yeah, I, got, I gave myself an alias. I want to be called Freddy. When you say Freddy, does it mean Fardad? Yes, it means Fardad. I just called me Freddy. Freddy, Fardad, potatoes, potatoes, same thing. No difference. As soon as I say, I'm Fardad, please call me Freddy, as of that moment, there is one person with two names. You say Fardad, here I am. You say Freddy. Here I am. Are we okay with this? Absolutely no difference. It's identical to the other one. Could you please point at me? At me? Point at me. Okay. Now, point. At, sorry, you, I, I'm going to give you some exercise today. Okay. <laughs> so he's pointing at me right now. Okay. He's pointing at Fardat. So if you look at him, he's not saying Freddy or Fardat. So Fardat is not present over there. He is pointing at me. Okay. Hand down, please. But if he calls for Fardad, then it's me, I. It's not my address. It's not where I am. It is me in a flesh. You understand this? Are we OK with this? We can do that in C++ and get away get like, and kind of lessen the pain of pointers. If I wanted to, if I wanted to, Read that car thingy. Let me just bring that car. 
okay? If I want to put values in that car thingy, what could I do I, if I actually want to write a function? I would have written over here void read, and in here I'm going to say car. Remember, no, no struct anymore. We are in C++. It's a type now. Car pointer CP, car pointer. Are we okay with this? Then I would say C out license plate. Then I would say C in into what? CP. And I put the arrow thingy and I'm going to say put whatever you want to put in the license plate, right? Are we okay with this? And if I wanted to read uh, and I wanted to continue with this, I could say uh, C out. make model, make and model, and I would go, if I can type it, and I would go C in into CP, that points to make a model, right? And I read make a model and I'm done with it, right? Okay, that's how I read. But in C++, we can do something else. Again, pause this. I'll give you an example with an integer in the local scope. Then I'm going to apply it to this one. So forget about this. Uh, am I using namespace? Yes. So I'm going to write int main. And on purpose, I'm going to write it down here so you don't see the things up there. So we only pay attention to what I'm writing. So if I have integer a over here, right, and what I can do is to create a reference for A, okay? So I can say integer reference B. I just made a mistake. I said integer reference B and I put a semicolon. Can you have an alias without an already existing thing? Is it possible? Can I say, I can't even say it in English. Like, how can I say, like, my, I don't exist, but call me Freddy? You can't do that. There must be a fart out to call it Freddy, right? It's the same thing. You cannot just create a reference. That's impossible. You have to create a reference and tell that this reference be, is actually A. Now, how many integers do I have here? One integers with two names, A and B. Anything I do in B to B is exactly as I am doing it with A. So if I say over here B is set to 25 and I say C out A, what I'm going to get over there will be 25 because A and B are the same. Correct? That's the 25. Are we okay with this? If I, to prove that they are actually the same, what I can do is this. Let me see if it's going to work out. C out, unsigned, address of A, and I'm going to put a slash between the two, and I'm going to say unsigned, address of B. OK? So I'm printing where A is in memory and where B is in memory, OK? Let's see if it's going to compile or it's going to look at the two addresses. Identical. They are the same place in memory. Do we understand what references are? Are we OK with the reference? The only, and don't get confused with the ampersand. The other one was an asterisk. That's why I didn't say integer ampersand. And I always tell to my IPC students, let me tell to you right now, never name the characters as you are reading it. Say its meaning. Never say integer asterisk p. Say integer pointer p. Say what it means, and automatically it's going to fit in your brain after a while. So when you see an ampersand after a type, when you see an ampersand after a type, it means reference. Say reference. Don't say integer ampersand, yada, yada. That's integer reference B. That is a reference for A. Are we OK with this? Pardon me? No, it's a reference. 
Yeah, they are, they, are, they are location of the same place in memory. They are the name of the same place in memory. Behind the scene, it is a pointer, but who cares? It's a reference, okay? Don't think about it that way, okay? Don't think about it that way. Let's think, of it, think about it as a rookie. So it is essentially a reference. Now, if I want to change the value of something with a reference, I can always do this. I can say read, read int, and I'll put over here int reference value. And in here I can say see out, enter a value, and I can say see in. I do not need to mention anything special in here. When I do this, what happens? Now, didn't I just mention you cannot create a reference without initializing it? I did, right? So what the heck is that thing I wrote over there? That gives you this message. An argument of, an argument of a function is always initialized to the value that is passed to it. That's how it works. That's how the values are passed to a function. So essentially, when you create an argument for a function, the value that is being passed through a function call is what initializes, is the value that initializes that, so I didn't break any rule in here. If I say over here, if I say over here, read int b, I am essentially initializing val with the reference b. Therefore, when this beautiful program of mine is called, it's going to give me error. What is the error? Read it must return a <laughs> Excusez-moi. Return val. <laughs> Sorry. I, didn't, I, I don't even know why I'm returning anything. It's a habit. I'm going to go void. OK, so now I'm going to uh, run it. Now it's going to say value, and I went to new line for some unknown reason. Let me actually fix it. I don't like it this way. Let me fix it. We, didn't need it. we don't need an end line over here. That's better. All right, so it's going to say value, and I'm going to say 1, 2, 3, 4, and I hit Enter, and what I get is 1, 2, 3, 4. And again, I appreciate it now It's that the address is different. Every time the program runs, it gives you another space in memory depending on what operating system decides, where operating system decides your program is in. Are we okay with this? Yes, madam. Pardon me? Font size. Which one? For the output or the code? For the output? Let me see if it's going to work or it's going to reset. Thank you very much for letting me know. Let me run it and see if it actually works again, or I have to reset it again. No, it actually works perfectly. There we go. OK, so value 1, 2, 3, 4. I run it, and that's the value that is read, and it's printed. OK? Are we OK with this? So again, to walk through this, what happens is actually this. So essentially. When, I, when it runs, B becomes a reference of A, so B has the value, and A has the exact same garbage value in it because they are the same thing. Then it sends the reference of B to val, so val essentially becomes a new name for B, which is A, right? Then it's going to say to enter the value. Now I'm going to say 1, 2, 3, 4, and I hit enter. And 1, 2, 3, 4 will go to val. But is it going to val? No. It is actually going to B, that is A. So I have one integer with three names now, A, B, and val, right? So if I call it again with some other integer at the moment, val becomes the name of that one, and it works the same way. And now if it comes down over here, you'll see that val is changed, and life is beautiful. All right? 
and the addresses are the same again. Are we okay? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? All right. So that's references that we needed to know. You can use references everywhere. And references are very useful. Why? Remember in IPC 144, they told you that it's always better to pass a structure with its address. Somebody can tell me why? Why we, when we wanted to, for example, print a structure, instead of passing the structure by value, we prefer to pass a constant address of the, of the thing. Why? To save space. Thank you very much. Because every single time you are passing something by value, first of all, they have to create a new instance in the function. Secondly, they have to copy all the information from one to another to able to print it. And then at the end of the class, uh, at the end of the function, it has to get destroyed, right? So lots of work to be done. Now, we can do the exact same thing. Now, this one I have to save because I don't have it in here. So. In here, it's going to be, um, I'm going to put to zero, um, alt F A. So this one's going to be uh, 2.5, because it's between 2 and 3 uh, references. All right, now back to what we were talking about. So say I have the car. All right? Now I want to create a function that displays a car. If I want to do that, what do I do? I actually pass a constant character reference now because I don't want to deal with that arrow thingy anymore. So that car reference of mine, C, becomes the new name for any reference that is being passed to it. And it's constant, so I can change it. So everything's good. The function display is going to run hundreds of times faster than a function display that receives a, a value. It works the exact same way like a pointer, but less syntax, right? Easier to work with, especially for those people who have phobia of pointers. So if I want to actually instantiate these things and display them one by one, I could have, you have done this in C language already, create different types of uh, cars. Right? A Honda Civic, a Cadillac XT5, a Tesla Model 3. So I have three cars in here created with different license plate, plates. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? Now if I want to print these one by one, what can I do? Call the function three times and it's done, right? But I, don't, I want to write a for loop. I want to write the, print this in a loop. How can I do that? Easy. An array of pointers. What do I do? I create an array of pointers. I'm going to say car pointer. Again, I'm not going to say asterisk. Car pointer. Let's call it cars. Three of them. And I'm going to initialize it to what? To address of A, address of B, address of C. Right? So now I have three pointers in an array, right? And these three pointers, each of them is holding the address of one of those car instances that I created. Now I can comfortably put this thing in a loop and pass them one by one to display. So I can say for int i set to 0, i less than 3, and i plus plus. Now I can say display, right? So display. I need to put the reference of car 0, car 1 and car 2 over there. So in here, it has to be cars i. I know that. But the problem is that this one is a pointer. It's an address, right? How do I get a reference out of an address? With? With? With, okay, integer pointer p, p holds address of i. How do I gain access to i? Huh? 
ampersand takes the address of i. I want from with p go to i. Integer pointer p, p holds the address of i. How do I get to i with p? Star p, right? Bad people. So they didn't, it's not star, it's target of p, okay? Or content of, no, target is better. Target of p, okay? So use target for that, right? So in here, because I have the pointer cars i, to pass the reference to it, all I need to do is to pass the target, correct? The car itself. Voila. Now, my program runs through it, and one by one, it's going to send the values. Is it building? Uh, oops, did I overwrite? I overwrite my references. No, did I? Yes, I did. Copy. Open this one. This is my read thingy, right? Sorry, I have to do some Frankenstein thingy over here. So paste. Take this back up. Sorry, my apologies, my apologies. My apologies for the interruption. Go back to references. Put this one over here. Save it. Get out. And now run it. My apologies. All right, there we go. Now, if I run this, then I will have the three cars printed one by one. Are we okay with this? Anybody wants me to walk through this? You want me to walk through it? Okay. Uh, we have till when? 12.30, right? 12.25? 12.30? Okay. So, yeah, so, uh, where is it? Um, so let's, uh, let's go through it. So I, I'm going to press uh, F10. It comes over here, creates A. It's garbage, initializes to the value. So it's going to have license plate, yada, 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 and it's on the Civic, B and C. It creates an array, and each element of the array is actually pointing to one of those objects one by one, as you see, 0, 1, 2. Then it goes through display, passes the reference of the first car up to C. And when you look at it, C actually will be Honda Civic, 1, 2, 3. So it prints that one. Let's bring it over here. Okay, don't leave any space to drag this thing around. All right, and then it comes out. In the second loop, it goes up. Second loop, I becomes one. It passes the reference of index one, which is essentially the Cadillac XT5, and now C becomes the name of the second one, which is B, and then it's gonna print it. The reason that I put a constant over there is to make sure that I'm not changing anything in display. This is one of the but it works moments. Like they say, okay, if I don't put a constant over it, it works. Yes, it does, but it's extremely wrong to do so. Anything, again, remember the logic, take a look at the logic of anything you are doing and remember it now. This is extremely important because I'm going to take you accountable for it. Take a look at the logic of anything you are doing. If in that logic you are not changing, Anything in the reference of pointer of whatever you are receiving, that reference or pointer must be constant. Remember that. This is an extremely important aspect that you have to always, always follow. If your logic dictates display means display, it doesn't do anything but display, it must be a constant. Remember. Yes? No, two, two, two different, they're two different scopes. One is in display, and the other one is from two different, that have nothing to do with each other. Okay. All right. Uh, that's that. Now, Remember the function bar we were writing? 
that prints a bar for a certain length, that's my bar. Okay, so I have a bar function over here, and the bar function prints a bar, linear bar, right? So if I run it, it's going to print 30 asterisks for me. So if I do like this, three years later, it's going to actually show this to me. Are we okay with this? But, so I'm going to actually put this thing down here now. But I want that if somebody wants to print a bar and they don't mention how, I want dashes to be used for drawing a bar. If it was C language, I had to write another function and that function call it, say, uh, let me put the prototype up here. If it's C language, what I need to write over here is void dash bar and then int len. And in this one, I would call bar with len and dashes. Correct? Right? So I don't want them to type too much. I, want, I don't want them, I want everybody who wants to print a bar, it's going to be dash. That's the default of the system, right? The fault of my coding. In C++, you don't need to change the name of the function. In C++, you can call it exactly the same. And it has absolutely no conflict. Why? Polymorphism. Because they are the same bar. One is printing it with two arguments, one is printing it with one argument. Yes. Overloading is one of the aspects of polymorphism. Polymorphism has four different things. I call this fake polymorphism because it's fake. Why is it fake? Because C++, you know, how does it actually, I'm going to give you a break in two seconds, okay? After this, we're going to go for a break, come back, and we're going to do dynamic memory allocation. Yay. All right. So, uh, just uh, bear with you with this one. So what happens is that when you are dealing with C++, when you create a function, C++ actually names the function behind the scene using the name and the argument. So the top one is bar int char. The second one is bar int. So when you are calling this, you are calling bar int char. So it knows which one to call. So it actually checks the arguments and through the types of the arguments calls the proper one. Hence the polymorphism type of a thing. Okay? So that's that one. Now, and I would say, okay, if somebody wants to just print a bar, I want it to be 80 characters or 60 characters. And I want it to be a dash. So what I will do, I'm going to write that one. Now I'm going to say void bar. And in here, I'm going to say bar 60 and dash. Or I'm going to call the other one bar 60. Now I can say by bar 30, an asterisk. I can say bar 45. Or I can just say bar. All three will run, and the proper function will be chosen, and the proper action will be taken. It calls the proper one. Okay? That is called function overloading. Okay? We can overload many things in C++. Overload essentially means changing the meaning of an already existing thing. Remember what I just told you. Overloading means changing the meaning of an already existing thing, which means if there was no bar, I wasn't overloading. I was creating a new function. That's a, an important, important thing for you in future to remember. The meaning of overloading. It means it must exist. You can change its meaning. Do something with it. Okay? Now, if I was nuts, I could actually make that bar to do something else. But logic dictates when I overload a function, I should make the function to do the same, th same thing in a different way. 
not one bar prints a bar and the other bar asks for an integer and the third bar jumps out and dances for you. It, you, you can't do that. You have, to, you have to make them work the same way. That's sanity of programming. Are we okay with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? And we are up for a break. Five minutes, we come back. We're going to talk about some tough stuff. I am C++ has a feature that sometimes when the logic of two overloaded things are very close, it helps you lots of, it helps you lots of, I'm going to stand over here so these two guys can't see each other so I can talk. Okay, so what I'm saying is that when the logic of the two functions you are overloading are too close, so you're essentially making a call to the old one with different arguments, C++ helps you by saying, hey, if you want to do that, let me do that for you instead of rewriting and recalling the functions over and over. If you want people to fit it with dashes, if they did not provide the fill character, put a default value for it. I'll take care of it for you. You have seen it in lab. You have seen it in lab. I have done it in lab for you. Okay, your lab, one of the things had default argument. One of the things that you need to learn is sometimes, sometimes be able to hack a code and just go into it, although you don't understand the whole thing. Okay? So, and I'm going to do that in uh, lab 2.2. Two. So lab 2, you're going to have a module called utils. I'm going to give the whole thing to you for foolproof reading an integer and a, and a, and a character string in C++, and you're going to use it. If you can find out how it works, good. Let me know, okay? It's not actually a very t tough thing. It's just writing a little bit of things that you have, I haven't taught yet. But anyways, so if I do it like that, then it means if somebody calls bar with only one argument, which is length, it looks at the prototype and see, is there a default value provided for the second argument? If it's yes, it's going to use that one and call this. So essentially, this function is called 45 is passed to length, and the dash is passed to fill. Not only that, I said, if bar is just called by itself, I want length to be 60 or 65. So I'll put 65 over there. Of course, an equal sign will do. Now, it's as if I have three functions. And remember, you cannot omit a value of the second argument without the first one, which means you cannot say I want to default the length but not default the field. You can't do that. It, you have to always drop it from right side. So you, 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 what I mean is that you cannot call the bar in a way that you put a value for length and fill be defaulted to dash. That's impossible. Okay? Because if you pass it with one argument, it means the second one is defaulted and that's it. You had a question mark in your face. Am I right? Right? So what I mean is that if I write it like this, take a look at it. If I write it like this, I am providing the values for both len and fill, so 65 and dash are ignored. When I'm calling it as line 7, then I'm providing a value for len, so 65 is ignored, but because fill is not provided, it's going to pick up the dash. And if I don't provide any values for both of them, then len will be 65, fill will be dash. What I said was, you cannot do this. You can't say, pass an asterisk for fill and default the length to 65 for me. Because that's against syntax of C language. That's impossible. Can't do that. Are we okay with this? And these are default arguments. So it's essentially doing, oh, ah, it's essentially doing the same thing. If I run it, the output is exactly the same. Just instead of overloading the bar, I provided it with default values for the arguments. Yes, sir. 
Oh, that's what I wanted to say. Default values must be in the prototype unless your function is declaration and definition at the same time, which means you have the function before the main, before the caller function, and you want to provide default argument, default values, then you can put it in the definition of the function. But always, always, always create a prototype, and only the default values go to prototypes, only. Pardon me? You want to take a picture? I don't understand you guys, but hey. You want to take a picture? Go. What do you want to do? Oh, you want to do that? <laughs> I just crashed the computer. Okay. Are we okay? <laughs> All right. So that's that. So let's save that. That's going to be five default value for arts. So for dynamic memory allocation, I'm just going to do it on the fly over here. I'm not going to actually write code for it, OK? Uh, I'm not, I, I don't have any code prepared for it on purpose. I want it to be done on the fly so we understand exactly how things work, OK? Um, copying and pasting code for things that are very simple to understand is easy. It's nice. I just copy and paste the code. You see the code, and you're done with it. But things that are a little more complicated, I like to write code because it slows me down and gives you, bores you to death by me typing over there. And that actually helps the things to fit in your brain because you've got to say, finish it already. I know you're going to write that. That thing actually helps. So I want to get some, I want to get some integers from the user and find out what the average is. OK? If you want to do that, what is the first thing that you're going to ask? So somebody tells you, I want you to write a program for me that receives some values and print the average. Can you do that for me? It would say yes. What is the first question that you're going to ask me? Huh? What kind of values? Integers. How many values, right? Because you have to create, like, yeah. And wait, I have, I'm going to continue. You don't need to say how many. Because when it's an average, it's, it could be an ongoing thing, right? You keep adding to it. You, you can do it just yeah. by one value. So, yeah, OK, right? OK, so what I'm going to tell you this. I want you to, to find the average of few numbers, print them all, and show me the average. Now the different, that, that completely different ball game. Because I'm telling you I want you to print them all. Or I want, to, I want you to save them all in a file and print me the average. OK? That's, again, easy, because you can do it one by one. But if I told you to, for, to sort it, print it in reverse order, things like that, things that you need all the values present before you do it, then you'll be in trouble. Because you're going to tell me, OK, how many do you have? How many do you have? I say, I don't know. OK, what is the maximum number that you're going to have? At least tell me that so I can have the array that big, right? So if you want 50, then you've got to say, I'm going to put 100 just in case if they want to go more, right? But if they want to enter the age of people in China, then you don't know how many you have. Or it could be some small country somewhere. So we want to one by one enter the age of people in a country, and we want to find out yada, yada, something like that. So if you want to do something like that, then that's not going to be possible. You have no way to know what is the size. And you may not have enough memory to do so. OK? That's when dynamic memory allocation comes handy, which means first, first, you can actually, what you can do, when they, are, they, when they are there, they don't know, right? But when they are actually entering the samples, they know. They know it's 5,000 numbers they are entering. They can tell you at the moment that the program is running, is about to run, not at the time you are coding. At the time you're coding, you had no idea, right? And not only that, 
We'll come to the point next. So first of all, let's do it that way. Have some integers and print them in reverse order. That's our task. If I want to do that and I tell you how many, I will say I don't know. When it runs, I'll let you know. If that's the case, you need to be able to get the value and do it. Now, when we are dealing with an array, what do we have? What is an array, essentially? Anyone remembers what is an array? If I tell you integer a5, tell me what is a5. What does it do? Analyze it. Integer a5. You have that in C. Somebody tells you integer a5, break it down to me. Tell me exactly what happens when I do that. You, can you do that for me? No, no, but, but what happens? If I say integer a5, what happens behind the scene? Okay, the first thing is that I'm going to have five integers, right, in the memory. A0 will be the first, A4 will be the last. These are all rookie kindergarten stuff that we are saying. But that's not really what happens. So, so, it, so, so it, it reserves five integers in memory for us somewhere, right? Now, depending on how we are doing it, anyways, you're going to have five back-to-back -back integers somewhere in memory. And it's going to name it A? No, that's not the case. That A is a pointer pointing to the beginning of the array. So essentially, when you say integer A5, you have six things. You have five integers and one pointer pointing to the beginning of the array. That's how an array works. That's why the notation of an array and a pointer is interchangeable. You can say integer you did that in IPC 144. When I have over here integer A5, to access the first element, I can say target of A is set to 25, 24, right? Because A is pointing to the beginning, that becomes the first one. If I want to access the third one, I can say add a target of A plus 2. And that becomes two integers address after A, after address A, which means the third argument, the third element, correct? It's, so if I'm crazy enough, of course, I can do this. Otherwise, I'm just going to use the square bracket and be happy, right? Or if I do this, it's the same. I can actually say integer, integer pointer P, and I can set that one to A. If I do that, now I can say P0 is 10. That means A0. P is a pointer. You can refer to it. I said the syntax is interchangeable. Because A is a pointer, you can use the syntax of uh, the index operator exactly the same way that you are using for uh, uh, an, an array for a pointer. Okay? What I'm getting into is that if you want to create an array on the fly, all you need is one pointer. Okay? So if I want to get some integers and print them in reverse order, what I need to do is to create a pointer to an integer to simulate an array. Now I need to know how many integers I have. So I'm going to say, how many ints? And I'm going to put the user's response in num. OK? Are we OK with this? Now I want to have an array to the size of that number. What do I do? I simply tell to the C, C++ program to ask the operating system for memory right at that time. So I tell to operating system, hey, uh, to, to C language, please get me new ints. How many of them? Num. So what happens, that statement, A is set to new int num, asks the operating system to give me memory, something available that you have somewhere in memory. Definitely it cannot be in your executable anymore. 
When you say integer A5, that thing was hard-coded, chiseled inside your executable. So if you have an array of five, your executable is, I don't know, 3,000 bytes, you make that an array of 5,000, then your executable will be 8,000 big because it actually puts the array inside your executable. With this, that's not the case. The array is actually outside of your executable in what we call heap. And it's on the fly. So what happens, now you have an array of num integers. Now you can one by one get the values by creating a loop. So I can actually do something like this. I can say integer i. I'll answer your question in a minute. Let me just make my point. Unless I made a mistake. Did I make a mistake? No, OK. So for i set to 0 and i less than num and i++, plus plus, I'm going to show a prompt to user, so c out i plus 1. And I'm going to get the numbers one by one. And I'm going to say not c in into what? Into a i. And I am 100% sure that the size of i is exactly how many things I'm going to get. It's not going to be one more. It's not going to be one less. Are we OK with this? Are we OK? Now, if I do this, now I can actually go the exact opposite. I can actually do it like this. So I can get them one by one, and I can print them backwards. So I can actually say i is set to num minus 1. Minus 1, i greater than or equal to 0. And i minus minus. And c out, a i is back to back. A i, that's plus plus by the way. The I, 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 I see up there, that's plus plus. I'm going to fix it in a second. So if I run this beautiful program of mine, pardon me? Oh, minus plus, yeah. That would have been an endless loop. OK, all right. So now if I run this program of mine, what happens is that it asks me to how many integers do I have? And I'm going to say I have five. Then I'm going to enter the values. And it's going to print them in reverse order. You know just what happened? Just like, and it per perf ended perfectly, correct? Right? What is the size of an integer? What is the size of an integer? Oh, four. Four, bytes. four bytes. Four bytes. How many integers did I have? Five, right? So 20 bytes, right? I just had a memory leak for 20 bytes. My memory, my computer is now 20 bytes less than it was before. Why? Because I asked for the memory, I didn't give it back. Have you ever done, called Rogers or Bell, say, my router doesn't work, say, unplug it, wait for 15 minutes, plug it back in? You know why? They forgot to free the memory. You keep doing connections, Wi-Fi connections, it occupies memory for it, and it doesn't delete it when the Wi-Fi thing goes back. Your memory of your router becomes less and less and less in a few months. And then it doesn't work anymore. You take it off, you reboot the system, program runs again. Until and after a month, again, your memory gets full. That's literally what happens. They wrote a program that had memory leak. That's literally what happens. OK? So remember, any time you get memory, you give back. OK? How do you give back? With a beautiful thing called delete. And you delete the way you create. I created an array. I delete an array. You put that square bracket thingies over there. If you just do like this, it just deletes the first one. <laughs> if you say delete A, it just deletes A0. Remember, that's, another, that's one of the major cause of memory leak. You think you deleted, but you didn't. OK? So what happens is like this. So I'm going to do it like that. Now I, I have a program that doesn't have memory leak. Now I have dynamic memory allocation, okay? And I can go as big or as small as I can. 
or I want. Now in here, it doesn't make much sense, okay? But imagine, let's say you are holding some people's names, okay? So I'm holding people's names in a structure, correct? And I'm reading that structure one by one. If I'm doing so, okay, I could say, okay, how big is the name, name of a person? You've got to say 20 or say, oh, believe me, I have seen people with 40, right? You say, okay, not big of a deal. I'll, I put 50. Or I put 100. So the name, I'll put 100 characters. I'll make sure everybody's name is completely safe. How many users do you have? 5 million. Five, so average name of a human being is how long? Pardon me? Entering those names, it's reading from a file. But 8 to 10, let's say. Eight to, let's say 10 is an average size of a person. But because of that three people who had a name with 90 characters, I have to do that. So 10 is average. I have 90 characters multiplied by 5 million. That's the number of memory that I'm wasting by not doing dynamic memory allocation. So at the moment of receiving something, you may temporarily get one thing to see how many things are coming in, but then you fix the problem. How do you do that? It's very simple. Let's say I actually have, let's, uh, uh, what do I do? Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. So I'm gonna say, this one is uh, number six. Number six, uh, DMA, dynamic memory allocation. I didn't know actually it stands for that. One of the students came and told me, uh, I have a problem with DMA. And I'm like, is that a disease or something? I mean, like, <laughs> but then I found that it's actually dynamic memory allocation. So after 20 years of program, everything now is abbreviated. But anyways, so now let's say I want to have someone's name and whatever, okay? Name and age, okay? So, or I'm just going to go with name now. So, I want to have a single thing too. I don't know if it's going to take it up. Well, let's do it. So, so I'm going to have a, a struct called name. Struct, name, and that name has a first name and a last name, right? So what I'm going to do over here, I'm going to say first and last. So, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? I'm going to put over here character, pointer, first, Character, pointer, last. So now my structure, what is the size of my structure now? How big it is? Eight bytes. Because four bytes is an address, right? It's just eight bytes. But where the memory for this thing is going to be, we're going to be somewhere in here. Why do I care? I have its address. It's not going to have any extra memory. So what I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to use the utils thingy that I'm going to give you to you. So I'm going to pick up that from uh, 244 dev workshops, workshop two, two, not one, two, workshop two. So I'm going to get in lab. I don't have it here. What? Shortest git. Oh. Okay. There you go, because I did it at home. I, all right, now it's better. In lab at home, in lab, there you go. This two utils thingy, I'm going to pick it up. Copy. OK. And I'm going to go back in here, because I want to use something uh, so I have the code that's easier to use it. Uh, 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 open folder. So I'm going to just drop it in here and use the, the modules. Paste. OK, and I'm going to add those two things, add existing items, add existing item. I'm going to add these two. There you go. Now, if you look at utils, utils actually is a namespace SDDS. Somebody asked me how to write the namespace. OK, so I am building it in namespace SDDS, and these are the value. So I have a function called read. It's reading an integer foolproof between min and max, and if something goes wrong, it prints an error message with a default value of nothing. So if I don't want an error message, I'm not going to put anything. Or I can put something like bad int redo. So by default, this is the message that's going to print unless you change it to something else. 
And in here, I am actually creating something to receives an, that receives an integer uh, uh, string up to certain length. OK? And that one, I'm going to put mm, bad string, bad length, string, redo if I don't want to show a specific error message. How it works, I don't care. I just know if I give a length and a string, it's going to get the, the length for me, right? Now in here, I want, I'm not going to even look at the code for it. The code, whatever it does, I don't care. Oh, strlin is not there. Uh, include c string and do I have that thing up here? It's going to give me the error message that I'm going to put it over there. Anyways, so now I want to read a name. If I want to read a name, I'm going to create a function for it. So I'm going to call it read, void, read. So this read is supposed to get a name, right? Value of a name and put it in there. So I'm going to just write over here uh, name, reference, n. So that's what it's going to get. It's going to give me a uh, read a name for me, OK? Now, how big a name can be? What is the biggest name out there ever? What can it be? 100? OK, I'll put 200. So in here, I'm going to say character name 200. OK, so I'm going to put 200 characters over there, as big as it gets, 201 for the one for the null byte. OK? Right? So that's what I'm going to put, right? Now, in here, I'm going to say, please enter, whoop, 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 I see out. Uh, first name. Okay. Now in here, I'm going to use that utils thingy that I'm going to add over here. So I'm going to include that utils. So include utils and using namespace stds. Now in here, I'm going to say uh, read. I'm reading, see, I have three different reads over here. So I'm going to say str n, uh, sorry, name. And then I'm going to say length is 200. And I'm not going to put an error message for now. So I read the name. Now I want to put the name in first name of the, of the n that I have over there. So I'm going to say n is set to new, and in here I'm going to say character, str length of name that I'm receiving, plus one for the null, and now I can do str copy, sorry, n dot first. That's a pointer, right? Now I'm going to say str copy into n dot first the value of name without worrying that it's going to be enough or not. And I'll do the exact same thing for the last name. I'm not going to repeat it. I'm going to complete the code and post it for you. But that's what happens. So when I read, I put an initial thing, big one. I get the value in it. Then I measure exactly to see what is the length. I add one to it because of the null termination. I occupy enough space and put it over there, then I'm going to say copy everything. I do the exact same thing for the last. The only thing I need to do over here is to make sure that I free the memory, uh, deallocate, let's call it, for, uh, for a name. And make sure that if the n first is not a null pointer. Null pointer is always, in dynamic memory allocation, sign of null pointer in dynamic memory allocation is always sign of this thing is not pointing to anything. All right? So then I'm going to say delete as an array n dot first to make sure nothing is left in memory. But delete does that by itself. I don't need to worry about it. Delete already checks to see if it's null or not. If it's null, it's not going to delete it. So I don't need to do that. All I need to do is delete this thing. 
and delete the last name. And make sure that I call that after everything is done. And now I have the first name and last name deleted. So I read it with this. I deallocate it with that. Perfectly done. Are we OK with this? So I can have 5 million of them, and it's going to occupy exactly the amount of memory I need and not one byte more. Have yourself a beautiful day. The next day you are coming, we're going to have a mini lecture in thing, completing dynamic memory allocation. The lab is going to be up. Start doing it now. When you are coming into the into lab, you should just submit it. Remember that. Have a beautiful day.